remember, remember, the 5th of November, the gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Guy Fawkes, t'was his intent to blow up King and Parliament. Three score barrels were laid below to prove old England's overthrow. By God's mercy, he was catched with a dark lantern and lighted match. Holler boys, holler boys, let the bells ring. Holler boys, holler boys, God save the king. And ever our diggery is our window into the past for a November the 5th. Broad Arrow Tower. Well, it smells. Well, it smells. It does smell actually. Yeah. Oh, Represent all the barrels of gunpowder that were planted. And this is basically the wanted poster that was put out for the gunpowder plotters. Guy Fawkes, Everard Digby and all the rest of them. Guy Fawkes is the most well-known one. Everyone knows about Guy Fawkes. So I'm going to use Everard Digby to focus on. And like my Halloween thing, this will be a two-day special. It's believed that Everard Digby was imprisoned in this area, that tower. <coughs> I'll just show you them quickly and then get the flash off because I don't want to spoil things for other people on the way. So there we are. There's the wanted poster. and off into the past through Everard Digby. And here we have him, the man himself, Sir Everard Digby. Born circa 1578, executed on the 30th of January 1606, aged 27 to 28. And this here is a uh, a little bit of an anachronism or a little bit of a wrong on uh, Wikipedia's part. He wasn't executed at Westminster. He was actually executed with four other men at St Paul's Churchyard. Wikipedia is pretty good for a lot of its info and I do rely on it a lot of the time but you do have to double check your facts. His children Kenon Digby and John Digby, and he was the son of Sir Everard Digby and Maria Neal from a uh, noble or landed gentry family. And here we see his motive, gunpowder plot, a conspiracy to assassinate King James VI and I of England and members of the Houses of Parliament. Conviction, high treason, 
He was hanged, drawn and quartered. He was enlisted on the 21st of October 1605 and apprehended on the 8th of November 1605. So he joined fairly late to the conspiracy, which you'll learn a little bit more as we go on. Old Guy Fawkes, third right. Most people have heard, know him mostly through the gunpowder plot, and if they don't know the full ins and outs of it, damn near everyone's heard his name. These are some of the gunpowder plotters, and this is a very early wanted poster. When the uh, plot was foiled and the men were wanted and everything like that, this is a little poster that came out. And there you see Guy Fawkes there, as I say. But Everard Digby, being a lesser conspirator and fairly late to the conspiracy, isn't shown in this poster. But here he is. And this is why I've chosen to use Sir Everard rather than someone like Guy Fawkes or Catesby or someone like that. Because so much is known about them. And a lot is known about Digby, but... He's one of the lesser known conspirators and isn't spoken of that much in conjunction with the gunpowder plot. So he's our little window into the past. The Digby family coat of arms, as you can see, a, a fine crest and coat of arms there came from a good and well-to-do family to have a coat of arms. But a lot of the Catholics, as soon as James came along, he was an ardent anti-Catholic very puritanical in his way was King James and uh, more witches were burned or executed in his reign than probably in any of the other reigns he was uh, hmm yeah the English weren't quite so sure with James and the Catholics had first been given a promise that he would be lenient to them and then those promises were broken hence you've got the gunpowder plot which in fact did Catholicism in this country more harm than anything than ever before and it wasn't really until the 1780s that Catholicism was legalized and it wasn't really until the eight, the early 1800s that it started becoming more acceptable but anyway back on to Everard Digby Everard Digby was the eldest son of Everard Digby Esquire who died in 1592, and his wife Maria, made a name of Neil, daughter of Francis Neil of Keythorpe in Leicestershire. Everard was also the cousin of Anne Vaux, who for years placed herself at considerable risk by sheltering Jesuit priests such as Henry Garnet. He was probably a near kinsman of the 16th century scholar Everard Digby, but it is clear that the scholar who died in 1605 was not his father, because as a fellow of St John's College, Cambridge, a celibate calling, he could not have been married at the time when the young Everard and some of his 13 siblings were born, nor was he a squire as the father is named in his Inquisition post-mortem in 1592. In 1596, while still a teenager, he married Mary Molshaw, or Molshaw, a young heiress who bought with her Gayhurst House in Buckinghamshire. By all accounts, their marriage was a happy one, and they had two sons, Ken Elm Digby, who was born in 1603 at Gayhurst, and John Digby in 1605. Unlike other English Catholics, Digby had little first-hand experience of England's recency laws. Following the death of his father, he had been made a ward of chancery and was raised in, in a Protestant household. His wife Mary was converted to Catholicism by the Jesuit priest, Father John Gerard. We've seen and heard about Father John Gerard in previous visits of mine to the Tower of London. When Digby fell seriously ill, 
Girard used the occasion to convert him also, and the two subsequently become very close friends, calling each other brother when we wrote and spoke. Gerard was godfather to Digby's eldest son, Kenon, and the Digbys also built a hidden chapel and sacristy at Gayhurst. A lot of the houses in those days, particularly of the nobility, had priest holes and things like that. It was a dangerous business being a Catholic priest in England in those days. Everard Digby frequented the court of Queen Elizabeth I and became informally associated with the Elizabethan gentlemen pensioners. His marriage had significantly expanded his holdings. However, and possibly for this reason, he left court to manage his estates. He was apparently an unforgiving landlord as his tenants in Tilton petitioned the Crown for redress when he failed to honour the expensive leases granted them by his father. He added to his property in Buckinghamshire by buying land in Great Missenden and one month after the Queen's death his social station was elevated when on the 24th of April 1603 he was knighted by King James I at Belvoir Castle. Four days later he was present for Queen Elizabeth I's funeral in London. Join me again shortly for part two for the plot and the plotters and Sir Everard Digby's role in that plot.